Bayside Church online. My name is Stephanie, and I'm the Director of Adult Ministries here at Bayside. I want to take a minute to thank those of you that were able to partner with us through the Walk for Life, as well as Donate Blood. Thank you for allowing us to partner with these amazing organizations. I do want to invite you to fill out your Connect card this morning by texting the word CONNECT to the number on the screen. You can fill out your Connect card like you normally would. And if you're visiting today, I want to invite you to fill out that Connect card and include your email address. We would love to send you just a little information about the church. You can also text the word PRAYER to that same number on the screen. We would be honored to pray for you and your loved ones. Lastly, if you would like to donate online, text the word donate to that same number on the screen and follow the link. You can also give online by going directly to our website at baysidechurch.net or mailing a check to the church office. We do want to thank you for your faithful tithes and offerings. Because you've partnered with us financially, we have been able to do multiple things over the last several weeks. We've been able to provide meals for the hospital emergency room staff over three nights. We were able to give $1,000 to our mission partners in Ecuador, who were able then to provide meals for the communities where they do mission work. Your giving is what made that possible. I also just want to thank you because of your giving, we were able to support our local elementary, middle, and high schools and appreciate the teachers and faculty. And it's all because you made that possible. So thank you for partnering with us financially. For more information, be sure to check out our website at baysidechurch.net and follow us on social media at Bayside Church SH. Enjoy this message from Pastor Terry. Greetings and welcome to the service. We are so glad uh, that you've decided to worship with us today. Wherever you're at, whether you're at home, on the beach, in the bedroom, in your automobile, wherever you are, welcome. And we believe that God can show up right where you're at. Uh, So I hope you've come to this moment uh, with some expectation of what God is going to say to you and what he's going to speak deeply to your heart. Hey, if you have a chance, take, take a minute right now to share this. You know, we, we've, we're hearing so many stories of people's lives that are being touched because a friend shared it with a friend and they saw it on Facebook, on their, someone's timeline and began to watch and God touched their heart. So take just a second now and share this video and, um, and we believe God is going to use it to touch many, many lives. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. And I do want to reiterate what Stephanie said about just how generous and amazing you guys are. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, In addition to the several things that Stephanie mentioned that we've we've been able to do over the last 10 weeks or so through uh, this uh, pandemic and reaching out to the local community, um, there were other things that hopefully if you're getting the email you, uh, from me and our, our weekly newsletter, you've heard some of those stories of ways we've been able to bless, bless the communities, but e- community. But even Saturday, 
Uh, just this past Saturday, we've, we were uh, hosted the uh, One Blood, the Blood Mobile here, and just an overwhelming response. And they were so blessed and so appreciative of, uh, of the turnout for that. So thank you uh, for responding to that. And so whether it was financially or giving literally your blood or your time, you guys are awesome. And I want you to hear that deep from my heart. I'm not just saying that. You guys are amazing. And, uh, and your generosity and your devotion uh, to our community and to the Lord during this time is nothing short of heroic and inspiring. So thank you. Seriously, thank you for what you're doing. Um, this morning, we are, we're going to be continuing in this series about joy through the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bible, I would encur- encourage you to, to turn it. Or if you have an app or you want to use some other device, uh, Philippians chapter 2 um, I'm going to be sharing a few verses uh, out of there, chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. I also want to give you a plug to think about as we're going through the message. You know, Cody and I come back on at, at about 15 minutes after the service is over. Uh, if you're watching it live, it'll be at, at um, 11.45. But if that whole point of that is to kind of think about and talk back about the message. So if, as we're going through the message, if things, if you would like to hear more about that or, you, or it triggers a question or a, a thought, hey, jot that down. And then when we go back live on Talk Back Live, send those to us and we'll try to address as many of those as possible. Uh, that has become the fastest 15 minutes on the internet <laughs> from 11.45 to 12 o'clock as we talk about uh, the message. That's a great time. So I hope you'll participate in that. So... What we've been talking about in this series is is basically this, that joy is not dependent on circumstances. That joy is not, in fact, the absence of adversity. Joy is the presence of Jesus. And what I want to talk about this morning is kind of unpack that a little bit. What does that mean? If, if, if joy is the presence of Jesus, what does that mean? You know, and, and speaking of Talk Back Live, this actually was inspired from a conversation at a, talk, a couple of Talk Back Lives that we did. <clears throat> and it was this idea, thinking about what is true joy? What was it that made the Apostle Paul being in chains in a Roman prison under house arrest, I should say, uh, chained to a prison guard, what was it about his relationship with God that made it such that he could be joyful. What is it about those of us who are followers of of Christ that whenever, even when things are bad, we can still have joy? How is that? Well, if you go back to the creation story, in the very beginning, God creates everything. And after God creates all that is, on each day of creation, he pronounces it good. It's good. It is functioning according to its purpose. It is just how I designed it. It is good. It is fulfilled. When he created man in his own image, he said, wait, this isn't good. There needs to be male and female. There can't just be male. There needs to be male and female. So he created male and female. And then after the creation of man and woman, he looked over them and said, that's very good. (laughs) That's very good. And so... From the very beginning, we get our sense of what is good and what is right and what is, when, and when we're on the other end of that, on the other side of that, when we're doing what God has created us to do, it's good. And there's a sense of joy that comes out of doing what God has called us to do. And so Paul, when he is in, cha- in chains to a prison guard, he is, can still say with everything in him, I'm joyful. I rejoice, not because of the circumstance, but because I know that my creator looks over my life and is pronouncing what I'm doing and who I am good. And because of that, I have joy. It's just like the song we just sang, it is well with my soul. The situation of that was someone who had lost family members to a shipwreck. It was a sad and and turbulent time in the author's life, but he can say it is well with my soul. I'm joyful in the midst of turbulence and trials. Why? Because I know that God has me and he looks over my life and he says, you know what? You're okay. You're good. I've got you. And that is is the source of true joy. Just knowing that you're doing the will of God. 
so that whatever your job is, whether you're going out to work or whether you're a stay-at-home parent or whether you're a student or whether whatever you're doing today, whether you're a volunteer, if you're doing what you know God has called you to do, regardless of the external circumstances, just that, I'm doing what God had called, called me to do, there is a place of joy. In that place, in that moment, is a place of joy. Joy is not the absence of adversity. It's the presence of Jesus. And I'll say it this way. Joy isn't the presence of a bunch of stuff. Because we all know stories of people who have a bunch of stuff around their lives. And guess what? They don't have joy. They've got all the stuff, but they don't have joy. Why? Because joy is based on the presence of Jesus. So Paul can say, whether I have a lot or I have a little, I have joy in every circumstance. I have joy. <clears throat> and so this morning, I, I want to I talk about, or today I want to talk about working out what's at work in you. As a follower of Christ, you have Christ in you. And the scripture tells us that Christ in you is the hope of glory. He's, in, in Colossians, he says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. In you, in, in you is Christ. And Jesus would say of himself, I am the light of the world. That light is in you and in me. So how do I, how do I work out what is already at work in me? Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. <clears throat> Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in, a quarter, in order to fulfill his good purpose. Good purpose. It is good. Verse 14. <clears throat> Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Several things I'd like to point out from this passage. <clears throat> First, in just observation, and it's really important because I think we can read past it too quickly, but when we talk about how to work out what's working in you, how to, how to bring forth the shine, how to shine forth what God has placed in you through Christ. I think it's really important to realize that Paul is speaking to a church that is doing it right, <laughs> that is doing it well. <clears throat> he begins by saying, dearly beloved, dear friends, beloved by God, keep it up. I, I want you to hear that because what the Word of God is not saying is it's not bashing you. It's not tearing you down. Paul isn't trying to scold the church. He's saying, friends, you're killing it. It's kind of like if you've ever played a sport or you played an instrument or you've been coached or tutored by something and, and the coach, you know, the coach blows the whistle. Stop, stop, stop. And you're like, oh no, what'd I do wrong? And he's like, no, what you just did, awesome. What you just did right there, that's how it should be done. That was amazing. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, look, what you're doing, keep doing that. That was killer. That was awesome. If you can keep doing that, if you can repeat that, that would be incredible. So Paul says, dearly loved, those of you that are loved deeply by God, keep doing what you're doing. And I want you to know that God loves you. <laughs> Right where you're at, wherever you're at right now, I want you to know that God, God's affection towards you is real. His affection towards you is significant. He ge ge uh, genuinely loves you and wants what's best 
for you. You are dearly loved. And so because he loves you so much, he wants to bring out of you the very best that is in you. God works in you in amazing, amazing ways, and he loves you. So I think that observation is really important because it begins there. In fact, Paul says, he begins the the verse this way, therefore, deeply loved by God, therefore, beloved children of God, therefore, what what is the therefore? And if, we're not going to reread it, but if you look back, it's that amazing passage of who Jesus is and what he did and the fact that he came from heaven to earth and and became a man and gave his life on a cross and, and God exalted him and now he has the name above every name. But in light of what God has done, how do you, how do, how do we as individuals let the light of Jesus shine forth? We do it like Jesus did it. First of all, we obey like Jesus. We obey like Jesus. What does he say? He says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence. Paul's saying what? You were, you were obeying Christ, not just when I was around, checking up on you, how are you doing? Yes, you know, like, you know, parents and kids, they do, you, they do the right things when you're like looking at them. <laughs> but then when you turn your back, it's like cookie jar, right? But Paul's like, no, man, you guys were obeying Christ, whether I was there preaching, teaching, encouraging, or whether I was off somewhere else doing some kind of ministry somewhere else. You just kept obeying. Keep doing that. If you want that light to continue to shine in you, keep obeying Jesus. And again, he's saying, you got this. You're doing it. You know, it's important for us to remember because... You know, sometimes people will think, man, I don't know about the, you know, this, this, what's all this obedience stuff? What's all this, you know, about doing what Jesus said? And it's like, I'm, I'm saved by grace. Forget that obedience thing. But what Paul is saying is that obedience to Jesus is essential stuff of the Christian life. Jesus once said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's like this. It's like a husband and wife who get married. You get married at the altar. You, you, you commit your lives to each other. You love each other. And so if you love each other, what are you going to do? You're going to keep your vows. (laughs) It's it's evidence of your love. You you live it out. You obey. So if you received Christ into your life and you really meant it, then we obey because we really meant it. Because we want to please the Lord. Because we want to do what will bring him delight. You know, sometimes we get mixed up with this idea of love and we think it's an emotion or a feeling. And there are certainly feelings and emotion associated with love. But love is not a feeling. It's a decision. I've had people, maybe you have too, have you ever heard of this? They, 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 they'll say bad things about you, but then they'll say, oh, but I love, I love him. I love him so much. You know, I can't stand him or, or his children or his wife or, his, or what he does or the way he dresses or the way he walks. But man, I love him. You know what? That's a total misapplication of love. <laughs> because love does. Love does. It's what you do that describes love. It's what you do that is an example of love. You can say you love someone, but if you're not acting in love towards them, guess what? You're not loving them. And Jesus, and Paul says, look, you you guys are killing it because not only are you saying you love Jesus, but you're obeying him. You're doing what he says. So if you want that lie light in you to shine forth. Keep obeying the Lord. Husbands, wives, you want to love your spouse? Do what they tell you. No. (laughs) That may that may may make for a happy marriage, but I'm sorry. That's not what I was going to (laughs) say. If you love each other, you do what will bring the other delight and joy and happiness. (laughs) You find ways to make them smile. Obedience is, why? Because of Jesus. Keep obeying, if you connect it, right? Verse 12, keep obeying, why? Therefore, therefore keep obeying. Therefore, what do you mean? Therefore, what's it there for? Because of what Jesus did. Jesus obeyed. So we obey him. We want that light in us 
If we want that joy that is about fulfilling God's purpose for your life, you've got to obey like Jesus. And number two, work out your salvation. Work out your salvation. Paul says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. To work it out. It is clear, it's in, in, you know, I, I've, listened, I've done a lot of reading and listened to a lot of messages and commentators about this passage over the last few weeks. And, you know, they all stop right here to make this point. And I'm going to stop right here to make this point because it's really, really important. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What he does not say is work for your salvation with fear and trembling. Work for. No, it's not work for your salvation with fear and trembling. It's work out. We do not work for our salvation. We are not saved by the good things we do. We are not saved because we learn enough Bible verses or we do enough good deeds or we obey the Lord well enough or we do enough things. It's not about, we don't work to earn our salvation. We are saved by grace through faith. That is, we put our trust in what Jesus did on the cross to save us. That what he did paid the penalty for our sin, and so that our faith is in him, we are saved. And so we don't—Jesus did that work. That work that he did made us right with God, and so now he's placed within us salvation. He's placed within us hope. He's placed within us um, righteousness. And so what do we do? We work that out. We don't work it in. We work it out. We don't work for it. We work it out. What does it mean then to live as, live as someone who has been redeemed? Salvation involves change. He says, work out your salvation. You see, when we receive Christ, we are justified. We are made right before God. That's what God has done for us. God has made us right. It's just as if we had never sinned. When we place our faith in Jesus and accept what he has done on our behalf. But when God looks at us, it's as if we had never sinned. There's also an aspect in which Christ, through the Holy Spirit, comes into our lives and changes our nature. We are born again. Nicodemus, the Pharisee, comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to be born again? He's talking about, this is a big, hairy, churchy word, but it's this idea of regeneration. You, you actually are created new. You're, you're, you're born from above. You're born once biologically and physically, but then through the faith in Jesus, you're born again. You're born anew, born from above. And so the Spirit in you births a new nature, a spiritual nature. And that's what God does in us. And then over time, through the process of sanctification, that what what has been created in us starts to work itself out as we become more and more like Jesus. As we grow and mature over time into the image of Christ. As we become more like Him in that we love God and we love others more. We work out our salvation we don't work for it, we, we work it out. What does that mean? That means we have to figure out what does it look like to love God and love others in every situation. I'm, I want to work out my salvation. So to work out my salvation, I need to look at my situation and say, how can I love God more and love others more? And so I'm not working for my salvation, but I want to let that light that is in me come out. And so I have to figure out how can I love God and love others in this circumstance so that the light is in me can be lived out in community with others. So I'm letting the salvation that is in me come out. I'm working out my salvation. So we're not passive in this salvation. It's not like we just receive Jesus and live however we want. No, we think about what does, what would God want me to do? What would be good for others? And how can I fulfill, back to Paul's point, what can I do to fulfill God's purpose in my life in this moment? How can I, how should I live in this moment so that God will look at my life and say, that's good. That's good. You're doing what I want you to do. And that's not always hard, right? That's, I mean, that's not always easy. Sometimes that's hard. That's why Paul says, you got to work it out. That's why he said, you got to work it out. You don't play it out. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes it takes prayer and deliberation and and reading God's word and, and over time to figure out what is the best thing to do in the situation to be loving towards God and others. Work it out. The awesome thing is that ultimately it is God in us 
who is working through us to help us work it out. (laughs) So it's not like, okay, I'm going to save you, now you figure out how to work it out. No! That's the whole process of sanctification is the Holy Spirit that comes into our hearts. It's like, I give you this light. I created you to glow and to bring light to the world. And I'm not just going to leave you alone. I'm going to work with you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to empower you so that together, in participation with me, you can work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, what is fear and trembling? That's not, a, that's not something we look, sound like we want to experience very much. <laughs> There's this word that if you've been part of the morning prayer times, we kind of stumbled upon it a few weeks ago in in our morning prayer time at 7.30, and it's this word, overawed. And overawed is actually a perfect synonym for for fear and trembling. Overawed. What does it mean? you're, You're awestruck. You're just in amazement. So Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Be overawed at what God is doing in you. Be amazed, be starstruck, be, I mean, think about it. God, God, God is at work in you. Like God of the the creator is actually close enough that he's inside of me and you, the heart of the believer, and he's working with us. He's bringing out that light that has been placed in us. So we work that out with fear and trembling, overawed that God is working in you, to be awestruck, to be in amazement. It's an awesome thing. You know, I don't think, I don't think we stop and just um, marvel at this enough. <clears throat> but you know, it really is an amazing thing Every time you and I do what God wants us to do. And just stop for a second. Every time you and I, who, for, you know, because human nature wants to do its own thing, but every time you and I do and choose to do what God wants us to do with our lives, that's an amazing thing. And it's evidence, it's evidence that God is at work in your life. I mean, isn't it true that there are times, if you look back, you're like, there were times in my life I never would have dreamed of wanting to pray at 7.30 in the morning. That that sounded awful. There was times in my life I never dreamed about wanting to worship. There There was times in my life I never dreamed of calling on the name of Jesus. There was time in my life where I never dreamed of trying to be salt and light to the community. There was a time in my life I never dreamed of making God's name great in my life. The fact that we ever choose to want to do in our lives something that would bring glory, not to ourselves, but to Jesus is a miracle. It's amazing. And it's evidence that God is at work in your life. I mean, it's the truth, right? There were times you would never be caught dead with a Bayside t-shirt on. And now you, you're wearing greater 2020 shirts, like you're going out of style. You got like eight of them. Where'd you get them from? 20, 20, by the way, 2020 ain't turned out to be so great, <laughs> but, but the shirts are nice. <laughs> But but yeah, doing things in your life that are pleasing to God, it's amazing. Parents, the fact that you're asking yourself, how can I raise my children in a way that will lead them to God? That's a miracle. The question, really just asking the question and having the desire. Business owners, if you're asking yourself, how can I leverage this business to bring glory to God? That's That's evidence of God working in you. Employees, when you go to work and you're like, I want to work today as unto the Lord. That's a miracle. That's evidence of God working in you. It's God working out what he's placed in you so that you can be light to the community. Paul says in this passage that God works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. To will and to do. What does that mean? It means that God is at work in us, helping. He wants us to shine. He wants us to achieve this, this, uh, his good pleasure. He wants this good thing that's for us to come forth. He wants us to shine like stars. He wants that to happen. And the way God does that is he works in us, changing our, our desires and our actions. 
Isn't that crazy? Can you look back over your life and see how your desires have changed? That's the work of God. Changing desires, causing us to desire what is good, causing us to desire what is right. And over time, as we grow closer to Jesus, more and more we desire the things that are good. He works in us to will, to desire it, and to act according to his good pleasure. You know, that's the difference between what Jesus does and religion. You see, religion is only interested in the last part of that. <laughs> religion is interested in the act. Not, not the will, the act. So, so it's what you're doing. You got to do the right things. And you got to not do this and you got to do that. And, and, and God leads us to right behavior. I don't mean to say that. But religion is, 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 is exclusively re- uh, interested in the actions. Where the work of God begins with the will. The Why? Why are you doing that? I want, God wants us to desire him. God wants us to, to, to desire the right thing. You know, you can do the wrong thing with the wrong motive all day long, <laughs> right? God's, work, God's after more than that in us, that we would will and do, that we would want to do the right. And Paul is confident this, And it's a promise for you and for me. And it goes back to chapter one, and it's this, that what God has begun in you, he will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. That that the best version of you, God is determined to bring it about. And he has placed his spirit in you. He's, He's let the light of Jesus come into your life, and he is going to work it. He is not going to quit. He is going to bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's gonna keep working in us and through us so that we become the very best versions of ourselves so that we bring more and more light to this world and more and more glory to Jesus as he works through our lives. Paul says he's confident that he who began a good work in you, Philippians 1, 6, he will carry it on to completion. You know who's carrying the biggest work in your life to bring you to make the light shining you the brightest. You know who's carrying the heaviest load to do that? Who's, who's, who's carrying the biggest workload? God is. God it will carry it on to completion. He's not leaving you alone. He's with you. As we started, he's, you're his beloved. He loves you. And he wants you to thrive. So if we're going to be light in this Hour, if we're going to be light during this moment, you think about our context in this, this pandemic, we've been in like 10, 12 weeks now. If we're going to be light, it begins individually for sure. Like I've got to let the love of Jesus, I've got to obey Jesus, I've got to, let, I've got to work out what God is working in me. And I've got to work it out sort of overawed, knowing that he is faithful to complete it. He's going to, he's going to carry it on to completion. But it also matters how we live together as a community. How we live together as a church. And again, Paul is commending the church. He's not scolding the church. And, and, and Bayside, I, I'm commending you. I'm not scolding us. I, I, think, I think you're shining. So I hope you hear all of this by saying, keep doing this. But don't, let, don't lose your shine. And Paul will address some things here that can help, that can cause a, a, a otherwise healthy and vibrant church to lose its shine. And so to keep from losing its shine, Paul will say to them, do everything without grumbling or, complain, or arguing. So a shining church doesn't grumble. In the Greek, this word, do everything, everything in the Greek, it, it means Everything. Everything, like do everything without grumbling or arguing. We know this, right? Like, doesn't it, isn't it true that nothing will kill the shine of the church in the presence of unbelievers or in the presence of the world more than grumbling? Grumbling. What happens with the light of the church when it's, when it's grumbling? It dims. It dims. And so, you know, get the context of what Paul is saying. Paul has said earlier that he's on trial, and he doesn't know if he's going to make it out or if they're going to, you know, send him to prison forever or execute him. He doesn't know. 
He's saying, so he's coaching them up. He's, he's pastoring their hearts. He's saying, look, whatever happens, I want your light to keep shining. And one of the things that can cause the shine, the glimmer, and the glow to be diminished in the church is when you're grumbling. So he says, in everything, do everything without grumbling or arguing. The word grumble is gagusmas. It's got the word goose in it. I don't know what that means, but it, you know, don't do that. You don't want to be a, a goose, right, or whatever. It's like, don't, go, and it literally means mutter. You know what that means. You know, you know what mutter is. It's this low tone sort of groveling. I don't know why they're doing that. That's the stupidest thing. I can't believe they're doing that. That's so dumb. I'm, I'm not doing, that's, they could do, I'm not doing that. That trip, tri, tri, no way. That's grumbling. <laughs> it's this murmuring. It's this low tone sort of grumble that Paul says, don't do that. It's grumbling about decisions and leadership and this and that about other believers. Don't do that. That will kill the shine of the church. And I bet every one of us, every one of us can tell the story of someone's shine that was killed because either they were a part of grumbling or they participated in some grumbling and we lost interest. I mean, grumbling, it's what Paul is saying is grumbling is bad advertisement. It's bad advertisement. For the gospel, right? I mean, who wants to be around a church? Like, you need to have the joy in you like I have in me. I can't stand that. Man, he's a jerk. Oh, who wants that? It's like people get enough of that out there. And, and friends, let me, let me just speak a word to you right now in this moment. Right now, there are 11 million theories about what, what, is, what we're going through. Every conspiracy theory known to man, and they're being cranked out by the moment. And people start, you know, murmuring, murmuring about the government, murmuring about leadership, murmuring about Bill Gates, murmuring about Fauci, murmuring about DeSantis, murmuring about Trump, murmuring about Cuomo, murmuring, stop it, stop. If you want to kill your shine, keep grumbling. But if you want to shine in this moment, you got you to do away with the murmuring. Do away with the arguing. I know. I, some of you got mad right there. Some of you got mad. Some of you just did not like it that I, I mentioned some of those people. But it's the truth. You got to shine. You know, this language comes from, you know, this language comes from about grumbling and arguing. It comes from the children of Israel in the wilderness. You remember, you remember that familiar story? Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egyptian slavery. They've been in slavery for 400 years. Uh, they're, they're led out into the wilderness. And uh, that generation was known as a generation that grumbled and murmured. They're like, ah, oh, Moses, he don't know what he's doing. He should have left us in Egypt. Egypt was way better. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> slavery? <laughs> building, building Pharaoh's <laughs> uh, pyramids was, was better? Like, what? Oh, you're just stupid. Oh, I've got to eat manna and delivered in the Red Sea. That was ridiculous. I've got mud on my feet. No, I can't stand that, right? Trade sand for mud. I got uh, this is dumb. What kind of leader is he? He's got that. He's got a murmur. He's got, he's got a speech impediment. Like what kind of leader is that? And God's like, no, no, that's not. I, I called you to be stars in the universe. I called you to to stand out. You're you're not standing out. <laughs> you're not standing it out. You're stinking it up because you're grumbling and murmuring. So Paul's like, don't be that. Don't do that. Let the shine that is in you, that is shining forth, don't let it be squelched by grumbling and murmuring. Don't grumble so that you can be blameless children of God. Blameless children of God. Second thing, a community that a shining church holds out the message of life. We hold out the message of life. What makes the church remarkable, what makes the body of Christ remarkable is in moments even like this that we're in, we're holding out hope. We're holding out perspective. We're holding out truth, the gospel, the good news. We're holding out the word of life. 
Paul says to shine, don't grumble and argue and keep holding out the message of life. Hold out the message of the word of God. Hold out, hold out the message of Jesus. That will cause you to shine. You know, friends, it's the truth. What you have as a believer is what no one else has. In this moment, there will be people who offer up their political answers. There'll be people who offer, offer up their medical answers. There'll be people who offer up their whatever, economic answers. And they all may be good or they all may be terrible or there's some variation of, of, of each. But the one thing that we as believers have to offer that is different and unique is the message of life. That no matter what, God is in control. That God has not forsaken us. That God is with us. That this too shall pass. We have hope. We have the message of life. Third thing. The darkness only makes it brighter. Paul says, um, shine like stars among this warped and crooked generation. And, you know, we look at our culture like, yeah, there's some, there's some warped and crooked generation going on. But here's what Paul wants to say. It's like, you know, that, that darkness that you're in actually serves as a backdrop for the gospel. The reason you can shine is because you're, you stand out from the world. So, friends, what I'm offering to us today is as we walk through this season, as we walk with the gospel and want to be children of light, we need to stand out from the world, not blend in, from, and blend in with the world. We need to, the, the, the darkness, the corruption, the, the, the argument, arguing and the, and the grumbling, that's the darkness that stands behind us. As we hold out the, the light of Jesus, we will stand out like stars. And the darker the sky, the brighter the shine. The darker the sky, the brighter the shine. Which is part of the reason the church is shining so beautifully right now, all over the place, is because there's darkness, there's fear. There's, scare, there's, 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 there's terror. There's all these things going on. And in the midst of that, the church is offering hope. We're shining. The darkness only makes it brighter. The last thing I'll say is that it matters. It matters. What you and I are doing matters. The gospel matters. Shining like stars in the universe, it matters. What is absolutely stunning here is that Paul is saying to the Philippians that you can be what the children of Israel weren't. You can stand out. You can be a light to the nations. And what you're doing matters. You know, I was thinking about how this works, and you've probably all seen these things. You go to a party or whatever, and you see the, um, or a festival or carnival. Remember when we used to have those? Um, <laughs> and you would go to a festival or a carnival, and, and they'd give, these, give out these little glow sticks. These are some, these are some small ones, but, um, but these little glow sticks. And so what, what I would just say is what, what Paul is telling us to do is we need to glow, and your glow matters. Now, um, what, I, what, I've, uh, what I've learned is these phosphorescent little glow sticks are, 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 it's kind of interesting. Like they have the phosphor in it is sort of activated by a light source. And so you know how it works, right? The, the closer you are, the closer, it, you, you put it up to a light source and, and the light uh, sort of, the phosphor in here starts to get activated and it gets brighter and brighter. And based on, here's an interesting thing. The phosphor will be as bright, this brightness is directly related to how long and how intense it is in the presence of the source. So the longer this phosphor is in the presence of a light source, and depending on how intense that light source is, will depend on how long this stays bright. And the br how long this stays bright is called persistence. 
It's like they made this for the church. I'm not even kidding. So this, this glow stick's persistence is, this, is the, the length and intensity of its, ability, of its, gro- of its growing or, or glowing. So the longer, this, the longer this is in the presence of a light source, the longer it's going to glow and the brighter it's going to glow, theoretically. Now these, this is an interesting thing. I was given a couple of different glow sticks from our children's ministry department who always have things when I just throw out random, hey, do you guys have? They always do. So shout out to uh, Miss Jeannie, Mr. Rick, awesome. So, so they had these little ones here and these little, now what I want you to see is that all of, all of these were in the same amount of light. But if you'll notice, I don't know if you can with the lights on, this one is, it didn't work. There's nothing to it, like nothing. It's, I don't know if you can tell, but it's like there's no, no glowing at all. This one, on the other hand, same amount of light. It's been indoors for a little while, so it's kind of faded some. But the same amount of light, and it's glowing. So the message this morning is be this and not this, right? Be this one. But for us, that means what? The longer, how, how do we glow? We glow by spending time in the presence of God. But you know what's interesting? If you take this, this glow stick outside, it looks no different. And, and sometimes that's what we do. Like, we want to get in the presence of Jesus and glow, 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 glow. That's what, when you're in worship, that's, no one can tell the difference. <laughs> the way this is actually accentuated, the way you can tell whether or not this thing is glowing. Like, if I go outside right now, I can't tell if it's glowing or not. But if I bring it into darkness then I see that it's actually glowing. So we, we glow by being in the presence of God, by learning and being exposed to him, by worship, by being with fellow believers. But we actually let our shine go forth in the presence of darkness. When we're in our communities, when we're in the world, people see the glow that is in us. When we receive the radiance of God and we're persistent and shining forth. Paul is saying all of this so that we will shine. So we will shine like stars in the universe, individually and collectively. And church, you're doing it. Keep doing it. Some of you this morning, maybe, or this afternoon, whenever you're watching this, you're wondering, how do, how do, that, how do I get that light in me and how do I let it out? I'm gonna give you really three quick ways. Number one, get saved. How do you get the light in you? Receive Jesus into your life. Secondly, how do I make that fan that light in my life? Get close to God. Spend some time with him. Spend some time with people who are on fire. If you want to get on fire, if you want perspective, if you want to glow, sometimes it's good just to be by someone who's glowing. And then be bright. Be in the world and be bright. Shine, shine like stars in this warped and perverse generation. And you'll be a source of hope. You'll be like a North Star that directs people back to home, back to hope, back to healing. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity for us to worship together, even in this setting, in this remote technology moment. We thank you that we're together in you, that you are where we are, you're where every person is right now. God, I pray for the person who wants this light in them, but they don't know how to do it. And so God, right now I pray that you would come into our lives, you would forgive our sin, that you would take the darkness of sin out of our lives and replace it with the light of Jesus. That you would heal us and deliver us and set us free. God, that you would guide us and direct us. And Lord, we pray that you would guide our lives, that we might be salt and light everywhere we go. And Lord, I pray that we as your family would continue to grow closer and closer to you, that we might shine in this moment. Lord, we pray your blessing. We pray your deliverance. We pray your hope. Lord, help us to be bright in this culture. Help us to be bright in this world so that people see you. They see your love. They see your grace and they find their way back home. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been an honor to worship with you. For more information, check out our website, so BaysideChurch.net, or follow our social media, Bayside Church SH. Don't forget, we have our talk back live at 1145 on a separate feed. You're loved. Thank you.